So far, no technology exists that can control what we believe, or so we believe. So our topic today is brainwashing and mind control, and we're going to look at some of the technologies that might be used for it, or to defend against it, but we'll also be looking at some of the implications this might have on civilizations far away in space and time. Mind control scares us for the obvious reason that it's an invasion of the most extreme and revolting nature, but it's also so frightening because politically and scientifically speaking, it's also so plausible. We don't really go through life fearing that murder or theft will be legalized in the future, but fear of a society in which everyone has been brainwashed is one of the most common themes of science fiction. Why? In part because it's something we already have to deal with constantly. Simply by existing in society, we are constantly subject to attempts to manipulate, sway, or indoctrinate us. Some level of it is necessary because children need to be educated in proper behavior, not just academic knowledge. But we know all too well that privacy and freedom can be eroded away for even apparently benevolent reasons, and we know there is no shortage of non-benevolent folks too. So we could end up with a dystopian nightmare, again something common in science fiction and nowhere better done than in George Orwell's novel 1984, a terrifying story set in a dystopia of constant surveillance and indoctrination. Not many sci-fi novels have such a huge impact that they make a permanent impression on society, but even 70 years after its publication, a reference to 1984 or the term Orwellian or Big Brother brings an image of utter totalitarian control to mind, regardless of whether or not one has read the book. If you haven't, I'd certainly recommend it. You can pick up a free copy of 1984 today, and also get a 30 day trial of Audible. Just use my link, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500-500. Let's take a moment to better define what we mean by mind control and what types of techniques need to be considered. There are, of course, levels to the intrusiveness of mind control. At the lowest level, they are simple influence, like when parents, educators, journalists, and others simply show and tell you things aimed at getting you to view things a certain way. If those people are your only source of information, their influence will shape your thinking for a long time, even after you're away from them. When that influence becomes more direct and is aimed at shaping your political behavior, it morphs into propaganda. Subliminal methods is quite a broad category, and it includes some well-proven techniques used in movies and advertising and by persuasive speakers. What they all have in common is that they exploit the fact that we can only consciously process part of the information we take in, and much of it gets processed only unconsciously. We're getting into sinister territory with conditioning and aversion therapy, which are called brainwashing when they're applied forcibly. Although stories like A Clockwork Orange explore its benign, socially beneficial uses. Then there is neurohacking, where we directly alter your thinking, using either neurochemicals or nanobots, by reconfiguring the neurons you think with. At the highest level of mind control, a new species could be engineered, or an existing one re-engineered, to simply possess or lack the cognitive traits of interest or of concern. There's no need to police or even forbid activities that no one is inclined to do. Obviously the categories in this loose hierarchy overlap quite a bit, and even there being 6 of them instead of 8 or 20 is pretty arbitrary. Most of the methods we'll discuss today arguably match more than one of these descriptions. In a society where mind control is ubiquitous and successful, you wouldn't really need a draconian police state or constant surveillance. There is no need to hunt for rebels if no one rebels, and indeed, citizens will surveil one another. If their neighbor expresses an anti-societal thought, they will render assistance to him by contacting the authorities, the same way you or I would call an ambulance if our neighbor fell off a ladder. It's not betrayal, and they're not choosing loyalty to the state over their friendship with him, they're doing him a favor, and he'll thank them sincerely when he gets home from his brain scrubbing session. After all, who doesn't want a nice, squeaky clean brain? Not a very dystopian civilization on the surface, in fact the really disturbing thing is that it might appear incredibly utopian. It's likely everyone would be brainwashed, 
even if only for things as simple as conditioning to keep them from injuring anyone except in desperate self-defense, and to be courteous and not to steal, behaviors we already do our best to indoctrinate people into. If everyone has that, even the supreme dictator, it's hard to call that an evil empire. Of course the idea is usually that the folks in charge are exempt from the conditioning and use it to enslave everyone else. Even for the other case though, where it is everyone without exception, the notion makes me rather queasy and I doubt I'm in a minority there. We have a term here for such civilizations, which is post-discontent civilization, in contrast to a post-scarcity civilization. This is a fairly hazy borderline, much like brainwashing and indoctrination versus conditioning children to act civilized, but the simple example would be as follows. In a post-scarcity civilization, people can get almost anything they want without much trouble and have a lot of luxuries. In a post-discontent society, everybody has been made very content with what they have, which may be virtually nothing. You probably indoctrinate your kids in a post-scarcity civilization to avoid excess too, like wanting their very own planet. They might still want one but feel embarrassed to pursue that request or tell people about it. For instance, while in a post-discontent civilization they might work 16-hour shifts every day while coming home to a filthy run-down hovel and be entirely blissful about that. This is the concept that truly terrifies us. It goes beyond even feeling that it's better to die on your feet than live on your knees, it's the notion that you could be turned into a drone who is entirely happy with that existence. That you could be totally oppressed and overjoyed about it. This is doubly problematic because we are aware of people for whom this is already true, particularly for mild forms of it, and because it comes up often with artificial intelligence too. One of the most common proposals for dealing with intelligent machines is to make them so that they love their work, and that's one of those thin ice areas. On the one hand, it's certainly kinder to make an intelligent vacuum that loves cleaning floors than one that hates it, but on the other, if we were raising kids to enjoy being floor cleaners, I think most of us would be pretty aghast at that. The analogy might be a bit iffy though, first, there's no reason to make a sentient vacuum cleaner and we do not react the same to being told a kid was raised to love being a doctor or astronomer. Second, there is also that line between compulsory and encouragement, and the motivation for it. A lot of parents have some dreams in mind for their kids, but they are rarely compulsory and typically done for that kid's benefit, or perceived benefit anyway. Our objections tend to come when it feels like they went beyond encouragement or wasn't really about the child's best interest. A lot of us end up following those parental dreams and loving it, I can't even write my own name down without being reminded I do, but that doesn't mean we are compelled to do it or that the motivations for that encouragement were bad. In a wider context, picking your kid's profession has been more the rule than the exception historically. Of course there's a reason why we disapprove of that nowadays. It's one of the reasons I tend to dislike the notion of creating artificial intelligence with preset motivations we picked with our own best interest in mind, not its own. I think there is a genuine difference between creating an AI to be a happy vacuum cleaner and building a bunch meant to pilot probes off to space, who are encouraged to want to do that but still given a choice. And a real choice too, not You don't have to pilot the probe, but if you say no, you'll be scrapped or used to run a sewage treatment plant. Fundamentally, you just avoid building something with any more intelligence than it needs, and thus avoid much of the problem, as being built to a task that requires intelligence and judgment than being built for the purpose of passing butter and for some reason being given sentience for this task. What is my purpose? You pass butter. Oh my god. Yeah, welcome to the club, pal. I think you need informed consent and enough leeway in the encouragement that alternatives are both available and attractive. Using that probe example, let's say we raised a bunch of artificial intelligences to run probes to other worlds. One reason to do that might be because you want to be sure that if they get out into deep space, far from supervision, they don't go off the rails and decide to exterminate some alien planet or park in a solar system and start manufacturing warships to come back and conquer Earth. You have guidelines for what you want them to do and not do while they're out far from Earth, but you want them smart so they can make good decisions and have some flexibility to pick those and carry them out. In such a case, 
Being absolutely certain they will not break one of those key rules is not only preferable, but arguably the best moral action. Let's humanize it though. Say we were launching a manned ship instead with a crew. Not folks we've raised from birth or anything, regular astronauts who entered a program voluntarily and enthusiastically. But we tell them the final step is they have to submit to indoctrination to follow certain guidelines, very extreme indoctrination, essentially unbreakable. Not weird or secret guidelines either, ones they've been told about during the entire program. They don't have to submit to the indoctrination, but they don't get on that ship if they don't. No other coercion, they might get picked for another program, they can leave for a new career, they won't be blackballed or mocked for refusing, but no indoctrination, no voyage. We've decided we simply can't risk sending out explorers who might, however unlikely, decide that the planet they found out there with life on it should be conquered, sterilized, or even visited, and we need to be sure of them because when they are light years away, we have no way of enforcing that policy. Tricky ethical case, because it was all voluntary. They knew what the rules and guidelines for the mission were from day one and agreed to follow them. And a don't you trust me defense isn't exactly reasonable, because it's not them arriving at that alien planet, it's them spending a big chunk of their life in stressful traveling conditions and isolation before arriving there. If I send a bunch of colonists off for a 40 year journey to colonize Alpha Centauri, but with the caveat that if they find so much as a microbe on that planet they ought to scrap that plan, I'm going to have my doubts about if they'll stick to that. This is the problem. We know the mind is programmable, at least to some extent, and we know we'll get better at it, and we know there are some very good reasons to employ it. Ethically, I would much rather tell a kleptomaniac that they could just be brainwashed into not wanting to steal anymore and go home tomorrow then stick them in a cage for a year, an expensive cage too, and so long as they've been given a choice and both choices are reasonable, I don't see the problem. A coercive ultimatum, like telling them it would be life in prison or brainwashing, is different and so is an unreasonable option, like being brainwashed above and beyond the negative behavior so they couldn't lie or do anything selfish anymore. He stole and so his option is to take the usual and reasonable punishment or have that specific bit of him adjusted so he won't repeat that behavior. It's difficult to argue his treatment is unethical in such a case. Tied into that, we already do a lot of voluntary behavior modification, and while one can argue about how effective hypnosis is, people who pay for it generally assume it is effective, which is what matters for the ethics of it. Similarly, Whether or not a medication designed to break an addictive habit is 100% effective, or just helps most folks, is not our major concern. There's not much difference in between taking a pill that makes you inclined to quit smoking and reduces the urges, versus one that absolutely and instantly removes the desire entirely, except that the latter will sell a lot better. The ethical issue there is if them taking it was voluntary and if it was full and informed consent. They knew what it did and all of what it did, including side effects. No secret additional effect of making you ultra loyal to the regime, too. Some folks might want to outlaw that, or at least control it, prescription only or only administered by a doctor so someone couldn't slip it to someone else, but there would certainly be a big market for such voluntary mind control. Most of us would still regard such scenarios warily, but wouldn't call that brainwashing. The effect was reasonable and they chose to do it. There was no coercion involved, or at least no unreasonable coercion for the prisoner example. We have to contemplate higher tech scenarios for this though, and it's good to set our moral groundwork first, that you either agree with the reasoning thus far and why, or do not and why not. Giving someone a scientifically formulated aphrodisiac and giving them some love potion brewed up by a medieval witch or alchemist is identical ethically if the person administering them believes both work. It doesn't matter that the latter is just sucrose and water, any more than you shooting someone with a gun full of blanks is okay if you thought the ammo was genuine when you pulled the trigger. That's important to keep in mind because, for instance, right now we invest a lot of money into marketing and advertising, and that includes research to make it more effective, which is blatantly an attempt to influence your behavior and mind. 
This is mostly viewed as okay though, as it is just influence, and people know they are being influenced and to what end and why, and they can resist it, and the folks doing it believe that too. The game might be a bit different if some computer was exactly tailoring a message to you as an individual and with such effectiveness you had no realistic way of not doing what they desired. That's part of the perceived danger of various technological approaches visited in science fiction, they are seen as not being resistible, either because they are not or we have no experience identifying that method of influence or countering it. Perfume or cologne is an attempt to influence people, but we know it, can detect it obviously, and the effect is mild and easily resisted if one wishes to, but many would be different, you might not know, you might not be used to it, and you might not be able to resist it even if you wanted to. There's so many avenues too, chemicals, visual stimuli, pheromones, hormones, subliminal messages, and so on. Indeed pretty much anything connected to your brain to feed it nutrients or data can be used to influence someone's thinking, and the higher the bandwidth, the more subtly or thoroughly or quickly one can do it. Vision is very high bandwidth, millions of bytes of data a second, far too much for your conscious mind to process, and thus particularly vulnerable to sneaking something through, such as subliminal messages. So imagine something even more high bandwidth and to which we have no neurological, biological, or cultural defense against. This would be the brainwashing ray or direct implants into the body. The typical DNA or RNA in a microbe or virus already has an awful lot of data in it too, so a tailored virus or pathogen need not be limited to simply screwing with your biochemistry, it could contain images. We get an example of something similar in Alistair Reynolds' novels Chasm City and Absolution Gap with something called an indoctrinal virus that can infect someone and give them visions or predispose them to believe something, not just screw them up chemically. And you would hardly have to limit yourself to just one virus either, you could infect someone with a whole slew of viruses, each containing different chunks of data, we could also send in nanomachines to do such a thing. Needless to say, if you've got neural implants already, neural laces in your head or machines to augment mind or body, you are even more vulnerable to very high bandwidth attacks such as neural hacking, and your brain is quite susceptible to electromagnetism, so while the brain controlling rays or fields of classic sci-fi are rather naive about the implied complexity, it is probably possible. We do want to be careful though, because these new methods aren't necessarily any more dangerous than existing ones, except in being unfamiliar and more sophisticated. We can get familiar with them and our defenses can be sophisticated too. We've been dealing with fears of mind-controlling drugs or devices for generations, and with computer viruses for decades, and while those are legitimate concerns, nobody's brainwashed everyone or hacked everyone's computers so far. Defense has been slow to improve but has kept up. It's likely to be a big market in the future though. You buy things to enhance the mind or improve it, hardware or software, and you buy things to protect the mind, and people will tend to avoid a lot of new technology till it's been tested and out there working for a while. You might want the newest and best brain enhancing devices but hesitate because of cost and unknown risks, you don't want the buggy or vulnerable new stuff or to be offline waiting for a patch. Beyond that we have the concern of something radically new getting in before we can defend against it, or something developed and deployed in secret by some shadowy group, but we're mostly worried about the slippery slope of good intentions. That's a very legitimate concern, and the scariest part about it is that technology is dangerous and brainwashing is actually one of the best defenses against dangerous tech. As an example, one of our big concerns is someone might develop a way to make nanotech or 3D printers or replicators that can make just about anything from a blueprint, so someone could make a doomsday device or super virus in their basement. Any crazy single lunatic could wreak havoc on us or even destroy us all, just one lone wolf. If a shadowy group or totalitarian government controlling us is a threat, at least it's usually assumed to be somewhat sane, just villainous. We've no shortage of individuals who are crazy, and the idea that any one of them might kill us all could drive a society to want to limit such technologies. The alternative to such limits on tech is limits on minds instead. 
Imagine if we felt the only way to keep us all safe would be to all get mind scanned for dangerous tendencies and controlled to prevent them. These could still be somewhat voluntary and customizable too. You might get everyone an implant that prevented them from engaging in mass murder, but you might let folks pick between a range of options instead and based on their security risk. You can't learn certain sciences without agreeing to be conditioned against using them for certain purposes or teaching them to others without permission. You cannot operate a 3D printer or train to use one without agreeing to be conditioned not to use, make, or distribute banned or restricted templates. You might get to select between being conditioned to be non-violent or being able to pick instead to have your mind scanned occasionally for instability or be followed by a drone that watches you. Some folks might prefer conditioning to not do something they really don't want to do anyway if that exempted them from privacy intrusions. This raises the slippery slope issue, even assuming such a civilization isn't already off the cliff and over the moral event horizon, but it also raises one of the weirder Fermi Paradox solutions. With the Fermi Paradox, the question of why the universe seems absent of other intelligent life even though it is ancient and immense, we always have a problem of why civilizations don't spread out. Common suggestions are that they can't because space travel might be impractical, or because civilizations kill themselves off, or because intelligence is just super rare. Alternatives tend to focus on why civilization might not want to spread out to the galaxy. A point I once raised in discussing this is that it doesn't matter if most people in a civilization don't want to colonize the galaxy, because some of them probably will, and if it is practical to do so, then it only takes a handful of people in a civilization, any civilization, to colonize the whole galaxy. Unless you are willing to flat out blow up any colony ship that tries to head out of your system, it really doesn't matter if most of your people don't want to colonize the galaxy. But if your civilization feels that limited mind control is the only way to keep everyone safe, colonization could get to be rather dangerous to you. All those folks elsewhere, separated by decades or centuries of light lag, are hard to monitor or reinforce their conditioning if it weakens, or to do anything about it if they skip off track. Remember, this could be a real danger too. It's possible just one person could make a doomsday device you can't defend against, and such a thing could be manufactured at Alpha Centauri and sent back to Earth too. One colonist breaking their conditioning might be able to walk over to the colony's 3D printer and a minute later have a device that lets them take over their whole colony and send back a genocidal armada to Earth and all of its colonies too. Alternatively, a solar system is a big place, and we've seen how many people you can put in one and how long you can extend the lifetime of a sun or protect yourself from natural threats. You might feel that is more than enough and more than safe enough, And if such technologies exist, they mess with our exclusivity issue with the Fermi Paradox. We often toss out Fermi Paradox solutions not because it's improbable a civilization might do something, but because it's improbable every civilization would. Space travel wouldn't seem exclusively limited to peace-loving aliens who dislike meeting primitive cultures, or don't like to interfere with them. So solutions, reliance on aliens staying away from Earth out of disinterest or principled non-interference, don't work well, even though many would probably do one or both. However, if technologies exist which are ultra-dangerous and can be easily created by any one person, that's a threat every civilization would have to deal with and not many solutions come to mind. Indeed that would seem like your options are extinction or mind control though I would imagine, or at least hope, that there were some alternatives. If there were not, you might easily have a universe that was full of nothing but isolated mind-controlled worlds as islands in a vast sea of empty or dead ones. Nobody expands out much for safety, and nobody talks much because there's not much to gain from doing so, it does enhance risk including the risk that another civilization might think your safety controls weren't good enough and come by to enhance it with better mind control of their own, or just wipe you out. The potential gain, new technologies and new ideas, new science or art or philosophies, what we tend to view as the big boon of meeting a new civilization, is probably not very attractive to them since those could rock their very fragile boat. I don't think this scenario is too likely, indeed I tend to suspect that we will constantly be improving all of our countermeasures for dangerous new technology right along with that new technology. 
but it drives home the point that mind controlling technology is potentially very seductive even to civilizations that are pretty benevolent and free of corruption, even ignoring how easy it is to slide into a totalitarian police state, or ironically even worse, a totalitarian state that doesn't need police anymore. It's a really scary thought, and for that reason one popular in fiction. From films like Clockwork Orange to books like Lowry is the Giver or Huxley's Brave New World, or sci-fi episodes like Star Trek The Next Generation's Chains of Command, or Blake 7, we see a lot of authoritarian dystopias that use such methods, and often arising from good intentions. The big brother of all these fictional works though, the one that inspires so many others, and terms we regularly use nowadays like Big Brother, is George Orwell's 1984 and it really paints a portrait of how you don't even need sophisticated technology or a contrived plot for how the grim, authoritarian, essentially invincible police state can arise. I also find it rather grimly amusing that the book has often been banned in various times and places as subversive or corrupting. A very influential work, as mentioned, and one adapted to film or TV quite a few times, often quite well too, though as usual, the book is better. If you haven't read it, I certainly recommend doing so, and you can pick up a free copy of 1984 today, just use my link in the episode's description, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500-500 to get a free book and a 30 day free trial, and that book is yours to keep whether you stay on with Audible or not. So a pretty grim topic today, but an important one. Next week we'll be looking at something rather more upbeat, as we start off the Earth 2.0 series by looking at seasteading and making artificial islands, and we'll move on a couple weeks later to explore deeper seas with colonizing the oceans. Before that though, we'll return to the Generation Ship series to contemplate how you would keep a culture strong and stable on such a ship over the many millennia it might need to exist to achieve its mission and just how long such a ship could be deployed in Arc of a Million Years. As a last note, we've talked occasionally of doing an end of the month live stream for Q&A, and we'll be doing our first one this upcoming Sunday, September 30th at 2pm Eastern 1800 UTC. We'll continue doing a monthly live stream after that, though we'll figure out the time, dates, and show format as we go. For this first time though, it will be this Sunday afternoon, and I hope to see you then. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week. Music